Tum Tum and Nutmeg, The Great Escape, by Emily Byrne, read by Ryan Hoff. Also, just so you guys know who are listening, uh, this is being read as a read aloud, so there may be some mistakes here and there that I do not take the time to go back and edit out. Also, there may be some comments by my two kiddos. Can you guys say hi? Hi! And uh, yeah, Thanks again. <laughs> and so they may provide some candid um, color commentary, or could possibly ask a question here or there. What a word means, something like that. So, um, without further ado, uh, go ahead. Chapter one. At Nutmouse Hall, the day had begun much like any other. Nutmeg had leapt out of bed at dawn and raced downstairs to bustle and bake and clean. And Nutmeg had stayed tucked up under the covers until he heard the Did bell ring it? for Did breakfast. You say nutmeg? I said tum tum. <laughs> I do sometimes mix their names up. Yeah. He tumbled down to the kitchen in his dressing gown. Good morning, dear, he said dozily as Nutmeg helped him to porridge and toast and scrambled eggs and bacon and a pancake or two. I thought you meant porridge and toast, and I'm like, why'd she be toasting her husband? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's see, what shall we do today? Tum Tum always asked this, even though he knew quite well what the answer would be. For although they lived in a big, grand house, the nut mouses led very simple lives. For the most part, Nutmeg spent her days scuttling and bustling in the kitchen and preparing delicious things to eat, and Tum Tum spent his days in the library reading the Mouse Times and toast toasting his toes in front of the fire. So Tum Tum knew what Nutmeg's answer would be. I think I'll scuttle and bustle in the kitchen, dear, she said. Good idea, he replied, and I think I'll retreat to the library and toast my toes by the fire. Nutmeg approved of this plan, so they both settled down to eat, looking forward to another peaceful day at, Nus at Nutmouse Hall. But just as Nutmeg was refilling the teapot, there was a loud rap tap tap on the front door. I wonder who that could be, Tum Tum asked warily. Nutmeg followed him through What's to the hall. Mean? Um kind of cautiously or suspiciously. Nutmeg followed him through to the hall, feeling just as puzzled. The postmouse was the only person who tended to visit at this hour. But today was a Sunday. Before Tum Tum had time to draw the bolts, the rap tap tapping started again. Then they heard a loud voice on the other side of the door. It's General Marchmouse, announced General Marchmouse, speaking in a very General Marchmousey way. <laughs> That's a lot of General Marchmouses. Oh, I said it again! <laughs> The general, Nutmeg whispered, looking at Tum Tum in astonishment. What on earth can he want? I can't imagine, dear, Tum Tum replied, for it was most unlike the general to visit so early. What a nice surprise, general, he said when he opened the door. In some ways it was, for the nut mouses were very fond of the general, who was very known to who was known to everyone as General, on account of him being rather generalish. But other ways, in other ways, it wasn't. For a while, Tum Tum and Nutmeg were very quiet mice. The General was an unusually noisy one. Noisy. <laughs> and today, he was at his noisiest. He marched into the hall and thumped two leather suitcases on the floor. Hello, he said heartily. Would you be so kind as to let me stay a night or two? Why, uh, 
Of course, General, Tum Tum stammered, feeling he couldn't very well refuse. Good, the General replied. Mrs. Marchmouse has gone to stay with her old nanny for a week, and I was feeling lonely, racketing about the gun cupboard on my own. Now that I'm retired from active service, time can hang a little heavy, you know. So I thought to myself, how jolly it would be to spend a few days with my dear friends, the Nutmouses, at Nutmouse Hall. Tum Tum and Nutmeg both groaned inwardly. There was no hope of a quiet day now. What's that? Nutmeg asked, noticing that the general was carrying a fat silver pole. That is a pogo stick, the general rep replied proudly. The Royal Mouse Army's new secret weapon. Whatever do you mean? Tum Tum asked. The general looked down his nose at him, thinking him very ill-informed. "'Haven't you read the Mouse Times, Nutmouse?' he asked. "'The army is being modernized. The soldiers are no longer going to ride squirrels. Oh, squirrels are old hat. From now on, the cavalry will bounce into battle on sleek silver pogo sticks, just like this.' Stand back, Nutty, and I'll show you how it's done. Nutty, that's a weird name. <laughs> yeah. Then the general Goodness, mounted... it's going to make a mess. Yes. The general mounted his stick and started to bounce, boing, 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 around the hall. Then he bounced, boing, 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 around the living room and the billiard room, and the ballroom. And so he went on, bouncing all around Nutmouse Hall, knocking into lamps and tables and stuffed cockroaches, and generally making a thorough nuisance of himself. By the time he reached the kitchen, he was bouncing so high that he biffed his head on the ceiling. Bam! He sat down to breakfast, feeling quite... Dizzy. Owsy. We mustn't let him out of our sight for a minute, Tum Tum whispered to his wife. We don't want him giving us away. Nutmeg nodded anxiously. Any mouse visiting Nutmouse Hall had come and go very carefully, for it was a secret house, which no human knew about. It was built in the cupboard of the mildew's kitchen and since the broom cupboard was hidden away behind a big wooden dresser, none of the mildews knew it was there. The nut mouse's front gates were just behind the dresser, and they were forever creeping in and out across the mildew's kitchen floor. But the mildews had never seen them, because Tum Tum and Nutmeg crept very quietly, and they did most of their creeping at night. At night they crept all over the place. They crept into the pantry and into Mr. Mildew's study, and sometimes they crept up to the attic where Arthur and Lucy slept and did all sorts of helpful things. Nutmeg darned the children's clothes, tidied their satchels, and polished their shoes with a mop once Tum Tum had mended the wings on Arthur's model plane. After Aunt Ivy's visit, the children and Nutmeg had continued to write each other letters, which they left on the dresser in the attic. But the children still had no idea that Nutmeg was a mouse. So that is what they thought she was. Oh, sorry. Um, she had told them in one of her letters that she was a fairy. So that is what they thought she was. The Nutmouses knew that Arthur and Lucy must never learn the truth. For some humans have funny feelings about mice, and think they shouldn't be allowed in the house. And imagine what the children might think if they saw the general bouncing about on a pogo stick. We must keep him constantly entertained, Nutmeg whispered, sorry, Tum Tum whispered to Nutmeg. Then 
he might just forget about this pogoing nonsense. What would you like to do this morning, General? He asked, jovially, turning to his friend. We could have a game of chess. Later, perhaps, the general replied, dabbing scramble, scrambled eggs from his whiskers. First, I shall go exploring. The broom cupboard's not big enough for a mouse on a pogo stick. I want to have a bounce around the mildew's kitchen floor and see if they've left any good pickings. This was not what Tum Tum wanted to hear. Now, look here, General. I don't think that's wise, he said. You'll only draw attention to yourself. And besides, the mildews never leave good pickings. They eat horrible things like canned spaghetti. That's why we have our food delivered by the grocery mouse. Well, I'd like to try canned spaghetti, the general said carelessly. Anyway, I won't be gone long. Just a quick breath of fresh air and I'll be home in time for lunch. Tum Tum looked stern. He did not often look stern, but when he did, he looked very stern indeed. General, so long as you are our guest, Rose Cottage is out of bounds, he said firmly. Now please promise me that you will not set foot outside the broom cupboard. We've 36 rooms here in Nutmouse Hall. Surely there's enough for any mouse to bounce about in. Oh, all right, then the general said reluctantly. I promise I shall pogo around here instead. As far as Tum Tum was concerned, the matter was closed, for a promise is a promise after all. But General Marchmouse found this particular promise very hard to keep. The general was a mouse who craved adventures, but since retiring from the army, he'd found them in increasingly short supply. He was starved of danger, and he had a feeling that by pogoing around Rose Cottage he might finally find some. And yet he was a mouse of honor, so of course he could never go back on his word. That would be out of the question. Huff, how tiresome to have to stay indoors, he thought crossly, helping himself to the last piece of bacon. He was still full of energy, so when breakfast was over, he mounted his pogo stick again and started crashing about in the ballroom. Whoopee! he cried as he went smack bang into a marble statue. I'll make as much noise as possible, then Nutty will get so fed up he'll let me go. But though Tum Tum... Mm -hmm. That's what the general's calling him. Nutty. That's but though Tum Tum could hear the racket from the library, he said nothing, which made the general even more frustrated. Now come on, Nut Mouse, surely it won't do any harm if I went out for a few minutes, he began as they sat down to a light lunch of earwig pie. But Tum Tum would not back down. I have already made my feelings clear, and I have no more to say on the matter. All right, all right, the general muttered. Then he finally let the subject drop. But after lunch, when Tum Tum had disappeared to the library, and while Nutmeg was bustling in the kitchen, the general found himself wandering into the hall with his pogo stick tucked under his arm. He stood there a while, looking longingly at the front door. You gave your word. The generalist side of him said, but the adventurous side of him said, Go on! And so on he went. No. Dun, dun, dun. He, That's terrible! He's gonna get caught. I know it, I know it, I know it. <laughs> yeah, probably, or something bad's gonna happen. He crept out of the door, then tiptoed toward the nut mouse's front gates. He let himself out and fumbled his way through the cobwebs underneath the dresser. Then he marched out into the kitchen, feeling a delicious thrill of adventurous or of adventure now that he was out of bounds. <laughs>
It was a foolhardy time to set out, for it was broad daylight, and someone might easily have spotted him. But the general could hear Arthur and Lucy outside playing in the garden, so he assumed he would be safe. "'I'm king of the roost!' he cried, bouncing gleefully across the kitchen floor. He had visited Rose Cottage several times before, and he knew exactly where he wanted to go. He bounced into the hall, then, gritting his teeth, he bounced up the stairs and on to the landing. Then he stopped suddenly, hearing something clattering in the study. He hopped across the carpet and poked his nose under the door. Inside, Mr. Mildew was sitting on the floor, amid a sea of tiny wires and twisted bits of metal. He was trying to invent a mechanical frog that could be programmed to catch flies in its mouth. But like most of Mr. Mildew's inventions, it was all going wrong, and as a result, he was pounding his fists on the floor in a hopeless rage. The general watched for a moment, then he turned around and bounced across the landing until he was standing beneath the steep flight of steps leading to the attic. He flung his pogo stick onto the bottom step and heaved himself up after it. I'll have all the toys to myself, he thought excitedly, as he huffed and puffed his way upstairs. I'll make castles out of building bricks and tie up the teddy bears, oh lucky old me. And even, But even the fearless General Marchmouse might have hesitated a moment had he realized just what sort of adventures were in store. Chapter 2 The general finally hoisted himself over the top step on to the attic floor. He was drenched in sweat, and the belt of his camouflage trousers was cutting into him. You must go on a diet, March Mouse, he muttered, <laughs> searching in his pocket That's for a humbug. He got to What's his... A humbug? Well, I don't rightly know, actually. <laughs> he got to his feet, crunching it noisily. Oh, it must be some kind of snack. But then he saw something that made him suck in his breath. He was looking straight into the barrel of a rifle. The general was so frightened, no. he could feel his knees wobble. Standing before him was a figure in red uniform with a visor hiding his face. It wasn't the uniform of the Royal Mouse Army, and though the soldier was the size of a mouse, he didn't have a tail. "'Do you know who I am?' the general demanded, trying to disguise his terror. "'Well, I'll tell you. I am General Marchmouse. So, uh, well, so there you have it.' The soldier ignored him, which made the general cross. Generals are not used to being ignored. "'With whose army do you serve?' the general asked briskly. But there was no reply, and that made the general even crosser. <clears throat> Where is your commanding officer? I shall report you for insubordination, he shouted. What insubordination mean? Uh, it means uh, not being uh, obedient. Oh. To be um, disobedient to authorities. Um... He was so cross, he forgot, he was frightened. There was, but there was still no reply. I have killed a rat with my own bare paws, the general roared, determined to impress him. Really? But the soldier did. Did he really? Well, he said he did. <laughs> I don't think he did. Uh, maybe not. But the general did not respond. So General Marchmouse did something very ungeneral-like. 
He reached forward and punched him in the stomach. But, to his astonishment, the so soldier just toppled over. The general blushed, feeling very foolish. For suddenly he realized that it was a toy soldier made of tin. <laughs> and now, looking around him, he could see dozens more of them scattered all about the floor. Some were in red uniforms and some in khaki. There were tanks, too. Um, look kind of a tan. There were tanks, too, and piles of sandbags and grenades, and there were machine guns the size of matches. Oh. The general sucked in his breath, hardly able to believe his luck. A whole battlefield stretched before him, and everything was mouse-sized. At last, he could come out of retirement and take command. Oh, how he throbbed with delight. I'll form the men into lines and command a full-scale offensive, he thought Ta -da! gleefully. Yeah. And it's like those things that are floating on birds and it, that, that are kind of like boats, but they're kind of like army boats. Yeah. And people attack. Yeah. Like those. Yeah. We'll, well, I don't know. He said, we'll, or he thought to himself, we'll blow up the dollhouse. <laughs> so the general spent a blissful hour ordering his new regiments. The dollhouse was placed under siege and its front door barricaded with a pencil box. The red soldiers were put outside to defend it, firing from the windows and the roof, while the khaki soldiers advanced on the building in platoons. platoons. Platoons, they're small groups of men. The general commanded operations standing on top of one of Lucy's ballet shoes, shouting, FIRE! until he was nearly hoarse. When he had hurled all the plastic grenades, he went to rummage in the toy box, looking for more missiles. He nibbled through the string of one of Lucy's necklaces and scooped the beads into his kit bag. Then he returned to his post on the ballet shoe and started lobbing them at the dollhouse one by one. He was not a good shot, so he succeeded in breaking, he didn't succeed in breaking any windows, but the beads made a satisfying clunk as they smashed against the wall. Smashed. <clears throat> yeah, um, or hit the wall, but it says smashed. When he had tired of that, he decided to have a go on Arthur's train set. The tracks, which had been painstakingly repaired by Tum Tum, looped all around the floor, and every two feet or so they sloped up and down in steep ramps. I could get up quite a speed, he thought excitedly. He jumped on his pogo stick and hopped over a bank of sandbags towards the glistening blue carriages. Sorry, old boy, he grunted, yanking a toy soldier from the driver's compartment. But General, but General Marchmouse is taking command. He sat on the stool and turned the big red switch to on. There was a gentle rumbling noise, then the train slowly heaved into motion. The General whooped with delight and started grabbing wildly at the controls, trying to make it go faster. Faster, faster, he roared, but Arthur's train set ran on a small battery. And however much the general punched and shoved at the knobs, it kept to the same steady speed. Let's see what happens if I freewheel, he thought impatiently. What's a freewheel? I'm not sure. Let's find out. The train chugged around a bedpost and up to the top of the biggest hump in the tracks, which was nearly as high as the dollhouse. The general hunched himself over the gear stick, <clears throat> then generally, gingerly reached out a paw and switched off the engine. 
The train wobbled a moment, then it lurched forward and started whooshing downhill. The general clung to the wheel, shrieking with glee as the room sped past him in a dizzying blur. Clear the tracks, he shouted, blasting the horn. General Marchmouse is bringing reinforcements. But then he saw the hairpin bend in the track just in front of him. He grappled in panic for the brake, but the train just hurtled on faster. Help! Help! He squealed, cowering into a ball on the carriage floor. His paws pressed to his ears. He felt the train lurch violently as it hit the curve, and then the driver's compartment skidded off the rails and sailed into the air. The general fell nose down against the window and saw his tin regiments spread out below him on the floor. I'm flying, he trembled. But the worst was still to come. For the next moment, everything went black as the carriage smashed onto the roof of the dollhouse. The general lay there, too dazed to move. At first he could see nothing but stars and flashing lights. Then, little by little, the room came back into focus, but everything was upside down. Gradually, as he came to his senses, he realized what had happened. The carriage had landed on its side, and he was squashed tight beneath the driver's stool, with all four paws in the air. The door was on top of him, where the ceiling should be, so it was no wonder everything looked topsy-turvy. "'Oh, poor old me!' he whimpered. "'What a pretty pickle!' But as he was lying there... It means, it means that he's in a lot of trouble. But as he was lying there, feeling as sorry for himself as any mouse can feel, he heard something that made everything much worse. Arthur and Lucy were coming up the stairs. Oh, no. Chapter 3 the general listened in terror as the children's voices got closer and closer. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> he knew he was in dreadful danger. Arthur would be astonished enough to discover that his train had been derailed. But what would he do when he found a mouse at the wheel? The general did not know Arthur as well as the nutmouses did, and he imagined that there might be terrible punishments in store. Dun, dun, dun. Gritting his teeth, for he was very sore, he grasped his pogo stick and used it to smash open the door above his head. Then he wriggled free of the steering wheel and pulled himself upright. Peeking outside, he saw that the carriage was stranded high on the dollhouse roof, lodged be be between two chimneys. He gripped the doorframe and hauled himself out onto the rooftop, wincing with pain. He tried to run, using his pogo stick as a crutch, but the roof was steep and he kept slipping. He floundered about desperately, but there was nowhere to hide. I'll never surrender, he vowed, and as Arthur and Lucy entered the room, tossed, he tossed his pogo stick down a chimney and dived after it head first. The children got a terrible fright when they saw the soldiers pointing their guns out of the dollhouse windows and the train lying on the roof. Lucy assumed it must have been Arthur's doing, and Arthur assumed it must have been Lucy's doing, and there were some cross words exchanged. But Arthur pointed out that it couldn't have been him, because he'd been outside all afternoon, and Lucy pointed out that it couldn't have been her, because she, 
she'd been outside all day, too. So who was it? Surely not Nutmeg, for fairies didn't do things like this, and it couldn't have been their father, for fathers don't crash their children's trains. <laughs> there must be another fairy as well as Nutmeg, Arthur said, a bad fairy which makes a mess. You know what I mean, a sort of elf. The children considered this a while. Neither of them would have believed in any sort of fairy a year ago, but since acquiring one of their own, they had become more open-minded. I wonder if Lucy, if Nutmeg knows, Lucy said. Do you think we should tell her? I suppose so, Arthur said. Let's leave everything as it is, so she can see for herself what whoever it is has done. Imagine how surprised she'll be when she finds soldiers firing out of her dollhouse. They both considered it to be Nutmeg's dollhouse because she had redecorated it from top to bottom with new curtains and carpets and cushion covers. She had even made a tapestry cover for the piano stool, and though they had never seen her, they suspected she sometimes spent the night there, for she kept a pair of slippers in its bedroom. So Lucy found some paper, and the children sat together on the floor and composed a letter. Dear Nutmeg, we think an elf has been in the attic while we were outside. He crashed Arthur's train and broke Lucy's necklace, and he attacked the dollhouse with tin soldiers, and he's eaten all the biscuits we left out for you. What do you think we should do? Love, Arthur, and Lucy. When they had finished, Lucy folded the letter in half and left it propped against the mirror on the dresser. I hope she does something to stop it, Lucy said. So do I, Arthur agreed. He was beginning to feel quite hostile to whoever had crashed his train. While, I'll, while all this was going on, the general was in considerable discomfort. By a stroke of misfortune, he had dived down the living room chimney, which was the longest of all the chimneys in the dollhouse. His pogo stick had clattered down to the hearth, but he was too fat to follow, and he had gotten stuck halfway down. He wriggled and squirmed, but he couldn't budge, for he was wedged upside down with his stomach squashed tight against the chimney bricks. In his undignified position, he had listened to the children's conversation, feeling crosser and crosser. An elf, he fumed, kicking his legs. I'll teach you to refer to the great General Marchmouse as an elf. But though he protested loudly, the children couldn't hear a thing, because mice have such small voices that even when they are shouting, they only make a tiny squeal. And besides, the general's shouts were muffled by the chimney. By the time the children went downstairs for lunch, the general could shout no more. He pulled in his stomach, trying to calculate how tightly he was stuck. I'll have to lose at least half an ounce before I can squeeze out of here, he thought miserably, and that would mean starving for three days. It was a very glum thought. Chapter four. <laughs> chapter four. Oh my goodness. All right. Okay. It had been a peaceful afternoon in Nutmouse Hall. After lunch, Nutmeg had scuttled to the sewing room to start work on a velvet smock for one of Lucy's dolls, and Tum Tum had pottered off to the library to put his feet up. I shall have a nice long read, he had thought, flopping in an armchair in front of the fire. <laughs>
But the fire was so warm, and Tum Tum was so full of lunch, that it wasn't long before he had fallen fast asleep. All through the house, there was not a sound to be heard, save for the tick-tock of the big clock in the hall. Nutmeg was so absorbed in her work that she hardly noticed the afternoon slipping by. Goodness, she said eventually, looking at her watch. It's gone four o'clock, and I haven't even iced the fairy cakes. So she hurried downstairs, but when she reached the hall, she noticed that the front door had been left open. That's odd, she thought, for she knew that Tum Tum was very particular about closing it. And all of a sudden, a horrible thought occurred to her. Oh, surely not, she whispered. Surely the general wouldn't have broken his promise. But something made her go outside and check the front gates, and they were open too. She raced back indoors, calling the general's name and getting no reply. She ran upstairs to look for him in his room, but neither the general nor his pogo stick were there. Tum Tum! Yeah. Right. Tum Tum! Wake up! Oh, wake up! The general is gone! Nutmeg cried, bursting into the library. Gone, dear? Tum Tum muttered sleepily, rubbing his eyes. <clears throat> yes, gone, dear! Nutmeg cried. Gone, bouncing around Rose Cottage, dear! But he can't have gone, Tum Tum said. He promised he wouldn't leave the broom cupboard. Oh, promises, promises! Nutmeg wailed. He's gone, Tum Tum. We must get him back before he's seen. Tum Tum raised himself to his feet and followed his wife to the front gates. Just as Nutmeg had said, they had been left wide open, swinging in the draft, and from the other side of the wall the Nutmouses could hear Mr. Mildew talking on the telephone. Well, we can't set out to look for him now, Tum Tum said firmly. Three mice would be much more conspicuous than one. The general will come home as soon as he gets hungry. We can be sure of that. We must just pray that no one sees him bouncing back under the dresser. Nutmeg agreed, but there followed an agonizing wait. They sat in the kitchen, listening hopefully for the sound of the general rap tap tapping at the front door but supper time came and went and there still was no sign of him it's most unlike him to miss a meal nutmeg said eventually he must be in some sort of trouble i suppose we'll have to go and look for him he's been gone for ages tum tum said but we'd better wait another hour or so, then everyone will have gone to bed. He may get injured, Nutmeg said. I'll bring some bandages in case he needs patching up. So at ten o'clock, after an anxious cup of cocoa, the Nutmouses finally set out to track the general down. Tum Tum, tum, -tum. yeah. Tum Tum held, held Nutmeg's paw as they groped their way under the dresser, for he knew it made her shiver to feel the cobwebs brushing against her legs. Nutmeg was a little wary of the rose of rose cottage spiders, for some of them were bigger than she was. When they stepped out into the mildew's kitchen, it was very dark. The curtains were closed and the downstairs lights had been turned off. Tum Tum shone his flashlight around the room to be sure that there was no one lurking. Then they scurried through every nook and cranny, calling the general's name. They looked for him in the cupboards and the cutlery drawers and in the saucepans and the teacups. Then they hunted in the laundry basket and the vegetable rack. They even looked inside Arthur's boots. 
and when they had searched the kitchen, they searched the hall, then the living room, then the upstairs landing, and then the bathroom, and drawing a blank there, they crept into the study and searched that too, while Mr. Mildew lay snoring on the sofa, clutching one of the legs of his mechanical frog. We'd better check the children's room, Tum Tum said, finally. There's nowhere else he could be. So, with much huffing and puffing, for they were getting very tired, the Nutmouses climbed up the long, steep steps to the attic. Arthur and Lucy were sound asleep, for it was long past their bedtime. But the Nutmouses entered the room on tiptoe, just in case. When Tum Tum was sure the children were sleeping, he turned on his flashlight and shone it over the floor, and they were both astonished at what they saw. Oh! Nutmeg cried, gazing around her in display. She had tidied the room only last night, but now it seemed like a battlefield. Whatever could have happened? she asked. Tum Tum put his arm around her, feeling equally bewildered. It didn't occur to them that the general could be responsible for such a mess. They stood in silence, surveying the chaos. Then suddenly they heard a noise that made them jump. It was the sort of noise a ghost might make. A long, muffled, Ah! They both stiffened and pricked their ears. There was a brief silence, then they heard it again, louder this time. "'It's coming from the dollhouse,' said Nutmeg. "'Look, the door's been left open.' They crept toward it, glancing warily at the tin soldiers firing from the windows. Then they poked their heads into the hall. The moaning had started up again, and it sounded much louder now. It's coming from in there, Tum Tum said, gesturing toward the living room. They tiptoed together through the door. Gracious, Tum Tum said, pointing to the hearth. It's the general's pogo stick. No sooner had he spoken than the moaning started again, but this time instead of, Ah! It sounded like, Help me! And it was echoing down the chimney. Tum Tum crouched in the fireplace and shone his flashlight up to discover a very wretched looking General Marchmouse suspended upside down. <laughs> General, Tum Tum cried, whatever are you doing? I'm hanging upside down, the General said furiously. Can't you see? I've been stuck here all afternoon. Now pull me down, won't you? Pull me down. The general stretched out a paw, and Tum Tum grasped it as tight as he could and pulled and pulled. Then Nutmeg held on to Tum Tum, and she pulled too. And finally, with Tum Tum and Nutmeg both pulling with all their might, the general thudded on to the grate. Oh, he moaned feebly, I thought I'd starve to death. How on earth did you get up there, General? Tum Tum asked, heaving him to his feet. I was hiding, the General said miserably, rubbing the bruise on the end of his nose. I'd had a perfectly pleasant afternoon, commanding the tin soldiers in battle. Then I decided to take Arthur's train for a spin, but the tiresome thing crashed, and just as I was crawling out of the wreckage, so it was you who caused all this mayhem, General, Tum Tum said furiously. When we saw the mess, we thought rats had broken in, but it was you. What a fine way to carry on. You break your word of honor, and then you come up here and wreak havoc with Arthur and Lucy's toys. It is hardly the sort of behavior one expects from an officer and a gentle mouse. The gen- A gentle man? <laughs> a gentle 
the general. He's a mouse, but he's not gentle. Yes, he is a mouse, but not so gentle. The general, who had been expecting sympathy, flushed angrily. But before he could utter a word of protest, Tum Tum had thrust an arm under his shoulders and was marching him out of the dollhouse and across the floor. I'm sorry, General, he said grimly, but you're coming back to Nutmouse Hall under house arrest. Chapter 5 As Tum Tum was leading his indignant prisoner toward the steps, Nutmeg noticed the letter addressed to her on the children's dresser. She quickly scrambled up to it, climbing by means of the various socks and tights and sweater sleeves tumbling from the drawers. She was dismayed to think of the children coming home to find all their toys in disarray, and she was terrified they might have caught sight of the general before he flung himself down the dollhouse chimney. So she was anxious to see what the letter would say. But when she read it, her mind was put at rest. An elf, she chuckled, glowing, reading in the glow of Lucy's alarm clock. So they think General Marchmouse is an elf. Goodness, what would all the mice in the village think? Nutmeg at once dashed back into the dollhouse and sat down at the desk in the living room where she kept her stationery. She had her main desk at Nutmouse Hall, but this was the one she used when she wrote to the children. There was even a little light on it, which she needed on nights such as this when there was no moon to see by. She dipped her pen in the ink pot, unfolded a piece of stiff white paper, and composed the following reply. Dear Arthur and Lucy, I am sorry for all the mess the naughty elf has caused, but I will come and tidy it up tomorrow night. I believe I know the elf concerned, and I promise he won't come back. You need not do a thing. Love, Nutmeg. She put the letter in an envelope and addressed it to Arthur and Lucy Mildew, the attic Rose Cottage. Her writing was so small that the children always had to read her letters with a magnifying glass. She stuffed it in the pocket of her apron then climbed back up the dresser and propped it against Lucy's hairbrush. After that, she rushed off to catch up with Tum Tum, who had already dragged his prisoner back to Nutmouse Hall. The Nutmouses were determined to keep Nutmeg's promise and to, pre to prevent the general from ever returning to the attic. So Tum Tum padlocked the front gates and he kept the key to the padlock on a string around his neck, so as to be sure the general could not get his paws on it. They had expected him to be furious at being held prisoner, but he appeared to take it quite well. On Monday, which was the first day of his captivity, he seemed restless, pogoing and pogoed around and around the ballroom. But on Tuesday, he was much calmer, and by Wednesday he gave the impression he was enjoying his quiet life. He helped Nutmeg make a stew in the morning, then he ate a magnificent lunch, and spent the afternoon dozing in the library. "'I do so like these peaceful spring days,' Tum Tum said as he led his guest into dinner that evening. "'Quite so,' the general agreed. A peaceful day is just the sort of day I like. Tum Tum was very pleased to hear this, but in actual fact the general hated peaceful days, and he was not feeling nearly as settled as he would have Tum Tum believe. The general was secretly still fuming at being held hostage, and was no and was longing to get back to the attic. He may have been battered and bruised by his adventures, but every bone in his body ached for another ride on Arthur's train set, and another chance to lob toy grenades at the dollhouse. So his relaxed manner was just a ploy while he plotted his escape. 
He had been thinking of all sorts of bold and foolish schemes. He could smash through the Nutmouse's gates with a battering ram, or blast them open with gunpowder. But since he didn't have a battering ram, or nor any gunpowder, he was unlikely to succeed. Then finally, shortly before dinner, he had, he had come up with what he considered to be a much more sensible plan. How about a game of Scrabble? Tum Tum asked when they had finished dessert. The general yawned theatrically. Truth be told, I'm feeling a bit sluggish, he said. I think I'll go to bed and read a learned book. Good idea, Tum Tum said approvingly, thinking he might do just the same. Sleep tight, then. Sleep tight, the general replied. Then he walked upstairs, humming a little tune. But instead of going to his room, he loitered on the landing. And as soon as he heard the nut mouses going into the library with their tray of cocoa, he slid gleefully down the banister and slipped out the front door. He had hidden his pogo stick among the croquet mallets. He picked it up and started hopping purposefully across the broom-covered floor. But he did not head for the gates, for he knew they were locked. Instead, he bounced around Nutmouse Hall toward the broom covers broom cupboard's back wall. High up in that wall was a little window, and it was through that window that the general intended to escape. It was far above his head, and the wall was much too smooth for him to climb, but the general had an ambitious plan. Pressing down on the footrest as hard as he could, he pogoed back and forth across the floor, each bounce carrying him higher and higher until he was bouncing so high he could see a fly cruising in the air below him. And then the general bounced higher still, and when he was level with the window, he let go of his pogo stick and grabbed the sill with both paws. He clung to it for dear life and heard the stick clatter to the floor beneath him. Then slowly he heaved himself up onto the ledge. No one can make a prisoner of me, he thought, as he stood looking down triumphantly on the rooftops of Nutmouse Hall. He wriggled out through the little crack in the window pane, then clambered down the honeysuckle to the ground. General Marchmouse strikes again, he chuckled as he marched along beside the wall. Then he held in his stomach and crawled into Rose Cottage under the garden door. Chapter 6 Mr. Mildew was sitting at the kitchen table, but the general crept across the floor behind him and reached the hall unseen. The children were in the living room. He could hear their voices carrying under the door. Dun, dun, dun. Good, he said, thinking that once again he would have all the toys to himself. But when he arrived in the attic, he found that everything was amiss. The soldiers he had lined up in battle had be all been swept to one side, and his sandbags had been dumped in the toy box. What nerve! he thought, furious that the children should have interfered with his battle scene. He rolled up his sleeves and began to drag his troops back into position. He arranged the khaki soldiers in crescents around the floor, and then he hauled the red ones into the dollhouse. He was dripping with sweat, and his camouflage uniform felt unbearably hot. There was only one thing for it. He would have to strip off. No one will see me, he thought, hastily removing his jacket and trousers. He undressed down to his underpants and felt much more comfortable. <laughs> Back to work, he grunted, 
and started lugging a soldier up the dollhouse stairs. And under him. He stood him on the landing, shooting downward toward the front door. Then he heaved another into the bedroom. Pow! Pow! he shouted, pointing its rifle out of the window. But then he reeled back in fright, for peering in at him was a huge human eye. It was Lucy, and she got a fright t too, as any child might who discovered a mouse playing in her dollhouse. Oh! she cried. But though she was very taken aback, she was still quicker witted than the general. While he stood rooted to the spot, she shot out a hand and shut the bedroom window, then snapped the latch down, latch down on the outside. Arthur, look what's in here! A mouse wearing underpants! <laughs> the general pan underpants! Underpants! <laughs> the general panicked and stumbled out of the bedroom toward the stairs, but by the time he got to the ground floor, Lucy had secured the other windows, too, and bolted the dollhouse door. He was trapped. Arthur came and crouched next to his sister, and they both peered inside, watching in astonishment as the little brown mouse stamped his feet in rage, demanding to be let out. "'He's the one who's been playing with my soldiers,' Arthur said, seeing the tin man on the dollhouse landing and the sandbags piled by the door. First a fairy, and now a mouse in underpants. There seemed to be no end of extraordinary things going on in the attic." The general was a mouse in underpants. A mouse in underpants. The general was rattling the windows now and kicking furiously at the front door. We mustn't let him go, said Lucy. He might cause even more damage. But we can't just leave him in the dollhouse, said Arthur. He'll keep us awake all night scrabbling. The children sat in silence a moment, wondering what to do. I've got an idea, Lucy said firmly. Just for today, let's put him in a biscuit tin. We can pierce holes in it so he can breathe and give him some food and water. And we can leave the tin in the kitchen overnight so he doesn't keep us awake. Then tomorrow morning, we'll take him to school and put him in Pet's house. He'll have a lovely time there. Arthur at once agreed, for Pet's house was a very agreeable place. It was a big wire cage, and all sorts of animals had lived in it. Once there had been a guinea pig called Sam, but eventually he'd died of old age, and then two hamsters had moved in. But one vacation the hamsters had gone to live with the principal, Miss Page, and she had gotten along with them so well that she had decided to keep them at home. And after that, two gerbils had arrived, but they'd had lots of children, and some of their children had had children too, so at the present time there were twelve of them living in the cage. Twelve gerbils. Good idea. He's bound to like living with gerbils. They're just the same size as him, Arthur said confidently. I'll go and look for a tin. Hearing this, the general became even more frantic. Gerbils! he cried in horror, hurling himself desperately against the front door. They're sending me to live with gerbils! Oh, the shame of it! Lucy stood guard at the dollhouse, making soothing noises while Arthur raced downstairs. A few minutes later, he returned carrying a purple tin with Scottish oat cakes written on the side. <laughs> he poked three holes in the lid with a compass. Don't <laughs> he poked three holes in the lid with a compass, and Lucy made a bed inside out of old socks. Then the children took two bowls from the dollhouse and filled one with breadcrumbs and the other with water. He'll be very comfortable in there, Lucy said. Then she opened the living room window and reached a hand inside. The general cowered behind the sofa with his paws over his eyes. Not a biscuit tin, he begged. Oh, please, don't put me in a dark, dank biscuit tin. But his protests went unheard. 
he felt a sudden brush on his spine, and next thing he knew he was being carried into the air in Lucy's fist. Then everything went dark as he was dumped into his tin prison and the lid shut on him. No! Dun, dun, dun. Let me out! I demand to be let out! He cried no, furiously out, as the Everybody, children... <laughs> Or he'll break the tin himself. Right. He got out of the window high above him with a He cried this furiously as the children carried him downstairs to the kitchen. Do you know who I am? But, of course, the children didn't know. And though the great General Marchmouse shouted with all his might, they only heard a tiny squeak. Much later... When he'd squealed and ranted all he could, the general collapsed on his bed of socks and sank his head into his paws. He thought longingly of his wife, Mrs. Marchmouse, and of their comfortable little home in the gun cupboard, and wondered if he would ever see his own bed again. And when he remembered what was in store for him the next day, he felt quite cold. Gerbils, he kept muttering. In horror, gerbils, I'm going to be sent to live with gerbils. The general had never met a gerbil before, but he'd been told they were savage creatures who went around naked and ate with their paws. He didn't like the sound of them at all. Chapter 7 the general spent a wretched night tossing and turning in his tin prison. He kept shouting for Tum Tum and Nutmeg, praying that they would come out looking for him again, as they had a few nights earlier. But his cries were in vain, for the Nutmouses were sound asleep in Nutmouse Hall, with no inkling of what was going on. And when Nutmeg went downstairs next morning to cook breakfast, she still didn't suspect a thing. The general had seemed to weir so weary after dinner last night. She supposed he was sleeping in. That will be just the thing he needs, she thought approvingly, melting a pat of butter in her frying pan. No doubt he'll wake up when he smells the kipper's cooking. But at eight o'clock, when Nutmeg rang the bell for breakfast, the general did not appear. I'd let him sleep in if I were you, Tum Tum said, sitting down hungrily. He must have worn himself out with that silly carrying on in the attic. But if he doesn't come down soon, his breakfast will spoil, not make fussed. I have an idea. I'll ta I shall take him a cup of tea in bed. That should wake him up. So she laid a tray with a pot of tea, a jug of milk, and a bowl of sugar, and made her way upstairs. But when she knocked on the general's door, there was no reply. I hope he's not unwell, she thought. She knocked again, and when he still didn't answer, she opened the door a crack and peeked inside. Dun, dun, dun. And what she saw gave her a start that she dropped, such a start that she dropped her tray, Tum Tum! She shrieked, racing downstairs. Tum Tum, the general's gone. Whatever do you mean, dear? Tum Tum asked as she burst into the kitchen. He can't have gone. I locked the front gate. Well, he's not in his room, and he clearly didn't sleep there last night, Nutmeg cried. The bed covers aren't even rumpled. Well, he won't have gone far. Tum Tum said, he can't have opened the front gate without the key, and there's no other way out, so he must be here somewhere. Tum Tum at once abandoned his breakfast, and they started racing around, no. racing around Nutmouse Hall, looking for the general. But though they searched in each of their thirty-six rooms, he was nowhere to be found. Then they went out of the front door and saw his pogo stick lying on the broom-covered floor under the window. 
and the same incredible thought occurred to them both. He couldn't have bounced that high. Surely it would be it would be quite impossible, Tum Tum stammered. Nothing is impossible for General Marchmouse, Nutmeg said despairingly. He must have made a great bounce for freedom after dinner. When he told us he was going upstairs to read in bed, I'll bet he spent the night in the dollhouse. And now he's most likely running amok with Arthur's soldiers. Oh, I do hope he hasn't been seen. Let's go and find him now, Tum Tum said. It's as good a time as any. The children will be at school, and Mr. Mildew will be working. They set off as, at once, letting themselves out of the gates, then creeping underneath the dresser. But when they poked their nose in, noses out into the kitchen, Arthur and Lucy were still there. The nut mouses waited while the children packed their satchels and buttoned their coats before finally making to leave by the garden door. I wonder what she's got in there, Nutmeg said, seeing the biscuit tin under Lucy's arm. Oh, I don't know, dear, Tum Tum replied, not thinking it of any significance. As the children were going, Mr. Mildew appeared in the kitchen. Have you remembered your captive? he asked them. He's in here, Lucy said, pointing to the tin. You do think he will be happy at school, don't you? Oh, very happy, very happy indeed, Mr. Mildew mumbled, pouring cornflakes into his coffee cup. We certainly don't want him in the house at any rate. The nut mouses looked at each other in horror. Captive, Nutmeg whispered. Surely they're not talking about the general. We'll soon find out, Tum Tum said grimly. When Mr. Mildew's back was turned, they flew across the kitchen floor and raced up to the attic. They realized at once that something was wrong, for there had been the most dreadful scuffle in the dollhouse. The crockery was smashed and all the furniture upturned, and two of the banister rails were broken. Look, the children have left, left us a letter, Nutmeg said, pointing to the dresser. The mice scrambled up to read it, dreading what it might say. Dun, dun, dun. Dear Nutmeg, We have found the elf, and he's not really an elf at all. He is a mouse, but he's very sweet, and we like him. We have taken him to, a, to school in a biscuit tin, and he's going to live with the gerbils in Pet's house. He will be very happy there, because he'll have lots of friends to play with, and so now there won't be any more mess in the attic for you to clean up. Love, Arthur and Lucy. He's been captured, Nutmeg said. Oh, how terrible! Just think of it! What will Mrs. Marchmouse say? She'll be quite beside herself with grief. They may never see each other again. Oh, Tum Tum, we have to save him! We will, my dear, Tum Tum replied bravely. Now, come on, we must follow the children to school at once. Knowing there was not a moment to lose, they both hurtled downstairs to the kitchen, then slithered outside under the garden door. The mist was still clearing, and as they beat a path through their, the grass, their coats got soaked with dew, or in dew. The school was just a few hundred yards or so from Rose Cottage, down the lane that led past the village shop. The mice had often walked as far as the school gates, for they had friends who lived in a mailbox a little way by beyond them. But in the past, they had always made the journey at, the, at night, when there was no one about. This morning it took them longer, for there were several people milling in the lane and a cat prowling menacingly. So instead of going along the tarmac, they climbed up onto the bank and scrambled along under cover of the hedgerow. <sighs> Excuse me. It took them nearly an hour to reach the school gates. The playground was deserted, 
for the children were in a morning assembly. So they ran straight toward the school building, then crawled inside through an air vent. They came out in the middle of a corridor full of bags and coats. It was a small school, but the nut mouses, to the nut mouses it seemed as big as a town. The children's wooden lockers were the size of houses, and the tiled corridor, lit by bright neon lights, stretched before them like a long road. Can you imagine seeing like a big hallway like that if you were a mouse? For a moment, they felt quite dazed. Come on, Tum Tum said eventually, taking Nutmeg by the paw and pulling her across the corridor. Let's try in here. He led her under a door with room 3A written on it. The other side, on the other side, they found themselves in a room full of wooden desks, taller than Nutmouse Hall. How disgusting! Nutmeg said, seeing a big glob of chewing gum stuck under one of the desk tops. The nut mouses went all around the room, shouting the general's name, but there was no sign of him. So they hurried back into the corridor and tried the next door along. This one had room 2B written on it, and as they wriggled underneath, they became aware of some sort of to-do going on inside. At first they could just hear shouting and shrieking, but then, rising above the din, came the unmistakable voice of General Marchmouse. "'I'll have you know that I am an officer in the Royal Mouse Army, you little ruffians!' they heard him roar. Then there was a chorus of jeers. "'That's him, all right,' Tum Tum said as he and Nutmeg crept into the classroom." But what they saw gave them a horrible fright. In the far corner of the room, there was a big wiry cage on the table, and inside the general was imprisoned with a crowd of naked gerbils. The room was otherwise deserted, so the nut mouses ran straight toward them. As they got closer, they could see that one of the gerbils was flicking the general with bits of straw. <laughs> the cage was lined with filthy bedding, and to Nutmeg's horror, the food had been served in a communal trough. The gerbils were making such a racket that the Nutmouses had to shout to get the general's attention. "'Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Nutmouse!' he cried out in relief when he finally heard them calling up to him from the floor. "'Oh, thank heaven you've come! I have been most hideously abused!' I've not even a blazer to my name. Oh, the shame of it. I want to take a look at the bars on your cage. Oh, no, that's not Tum Tum's voice. I want to take a look at the bars on your cage, General, Tum Tum shouted back. I might be able to cut through them with a hacksaw, but I can't climb the table. The legs are too slippery. Is there anything you can throw down? When they heard the word hacksaw, the gerbils fell silent. They had lived all their lives in captivity, but they still hadn't given up hope of escape, and the thought of getting their paws on a hacksaw made their hearts tremble with excitement. Hold on there, whoever you are, one of them squeaked down to Tum Tum. We'll make you a ladder out of straw. The gerbils all worked together, and in what seemed like no time, they had plaited a sturdy ladder out of their filthy straw bedding. They tied one end of it to the bars of the cage and tossed the other down to Tum Tum and Nutmeg, who climbed it hurriedly. Tum Tum went first, so he could help Nutmeg up onto the tabletop. But when they reached the cage, they realized that the general's predicament was much worse than they had feared. The cage bars were nearly a quarter of an inch thick. It would take the nut mouses weeks to saw through them, and the door was secured with a padlock twenty times the size of the one they used on the gates of Nutmouse Hall. They would never be able to break it to open. The gerbils looked on intently as Tum Tum and Nutmeg walked 
around and around their cage, looking for any possible escape routes. The general, who was usually so good in a crisis, was slumped miserably on the exercise wheel. <laughs> I just can't understand it, he moaned. This classroom is commanded by a teacher called Mrs. Miss Short, and before she led her troops into assembly, I told her who I was and demanded in no uncertain terms that I be let out, but she ignored me. She ignored me, and all the children seemed to think it was a gr it is a great joke that I was wearing underpants. <laughs> Body underpants. A mouse in pants, a mouse in pants. They all squealed as though they expected me to be entirely naked. I have never felt so misunderstood. <laughs> Who keeps the key to this cage? Tum Tum asked, ignoring this self-pitying speech. The janitor, the general replied glumly. Where does he keep it? Nutmeg inquired. On a big key ring around his belt, the general said. He wears it at all times, except when he's opening the door. And he's a giant of a fellow. You haven't a hope of getting it off him. And when does he open the door? Tum Tum persisted. During the lunch break, when everyone else is in the cafeteria, piped up one of the gerbils, who had known the same routine all his life. But he only opens it for a few seconds, just long enough to stick his fist in and dump more food in the trough. And do the children ever take you out for exercise? Nutmeg asked. Never, another gerbil replied. Miss Short won't let them, because we give her the creeps. I've heard her say so, so the children just poke their fingers through the bars and tickle us. And when there's a special occasion, a parent's day or some such, they decorate us. How? Nutmeg asked, astonished. Oh, all sorts of things, the gerbil prattled. Last time they tied pink ribbons around our necks and... But, but at this disclosure, he was interrupted by a great gulping sound. To everyone's astonishment, General Marchmouse was weeping. Oh, the shame, he cried wretchedly. The shame of it all. Can you imagine if the Mouse Times finds out about this? I can see their front page now. General Marchmouse has been captured. He is imprisoned in a school cage with a pink ribbon tied around his neck. I shall never live it down. Even the gerbils were touched by this. For there is something very upsetting about the sight of a grown mouse crying, no matter how badly he has behaved. But, try as they might, there was nothing anyone could say to console the general that morning. Chapter 8 The general was still sobbing when the mice heard the children making their way back from the assembly. I'll think of something, Tum Tum promised him. Then he and Nutmeg fled down the la back down the ladder. As soon as they reached the floor, the gerbils hoisted it back up into the cage and hid it beneath their bedding. Then the door opened and Miss Short came in, followed by the children. Quick, this way, Tum Tum shouted, pulling his wife toward the wall. They ran along the baseboard, searching for somewhere to hide, but there was not a mouse hole to be found. In desperation, they dived into a satchel lying open on the floor. Once they were inside, it felt oddly familiar. The canvas had been patched with gold thread, and there was a wooden pencil case with the initials A.M. scratched into the lid. Why, it's Arthur's satchel, Nutmeg exclaimed. I repaired it only last week. What luck, dear. This must be his classroom. And we must be sitting under his desk, Tum Tum said. The nut mouses crouched at the bottom of the bag, among the crumbs and the candy wrappers. All around they could hear the sound of chairs and chattering voices. Then Miss Short clapped her hands and the room fell silent. <laughs> 
Now, class, I have an announcement to make, she said. Nutmeg wrinkled her nose. She didn't like the tone of Miss Short's voice. As you know, I have been wondering what to do about the gerbil problem, Miss Short continued. When they came to live with us, there were only two gerbils, but now there are twelve. Twelve gerbils, children. Just think of it. If they continue to multiply at this rate, we shall have twenty-two gerbils by next term, and four hundred and thirty-two gerbils by the term after that and in a year they will number 2,592. Miss Short was a math teacher, so she enjoy, enjoyed these sorts of calculations. There were gasps all around the room as these extraordinary statistics sunk in. But 2,592 gerbils wouldn't fit in the cage, someone said. That is correct, Miss Short replied. And it is for that reason that I have decided to find our gerbils a new home. <clears throat> there was a chorus of groans at this announcement, for the children had become quite attached to them. But Miss Short was adamant. Now don't be sad, she said briskly. They will all be well looked after. Where are they going, Miss Short? someone asked. The nut mouses, still hidden in Arthur's satchel, listened anxiously for her reply. "'I am happy to announce that they are going to a pet shop in town,' Miss Short said brightly, as though this was a special treat, like, someone, like going to the cinema. "'I am going to take them there myself on Saturday when I go to return my library books.' "'Will they be kept together?' one of the children asked. The gerbils, who, like the nut mouses, had been following every word, all held their breath. Miss Short hesitated. Until that moment, she had not considered whether the gerbils would be kept together or not. She did not think it of any importance. I imagine they will be split into different cages and sold in pairs, she said finally. I doubt anyone would want to buy all of them together. The gerbils did not like the sound of this one little bit. When they heard that their family was to be separated, they protested violently, hurtling themselves against the bars, shouting and squawking as loudly as they could. Goodness, Miss Short said irritably, what a nasty noise they make. It's just as well we've found another home for them. What will happen to the mouse? someone asked. Tum Tum and Nutmeg recognized the voice as at once. It was Arthur's. The pet shop will find him a home, too, Miss Short replied. Perhaps they'll even find him a mate. I'm sure there will be much demand for a mouse wearing underpants. <laughs> the Nut Mouses bristled. The Nut Mouses bristled with anger, willing Arthur to protest. As he did, for Arthur wanted the general brought home too, it was his mouse, because it had been found in his cottage. It had been rather a nuisance there, it was true, and yet he felt protective toward it, He didn't, and he didn't, want, didn't see why Miss Short thought she had the right to sell it. I can take him home with me again, he said helpfully. He may as well go back where he came from. Miss Short, but, but when Miss Short was not keen on this idea. Don't be silly, Arthur, she replied. You told me yourself that you have no cage for it, and imagine what destruction it might cause if it were to run free. Just think, it might multiply. But I want to take him home with me, Arthur persisted. I, I wouldn't have brought him here if I had thought he was going to be given away. Now that's enough, Arthur, Miss Short said crossly. These creatures are all going to the pet shop, and that is the last I am going to say on the matter. That sounds like Aunt Ivy. <laughs> there was a sudden racket. There was a sudden racket from the cage as the, as the general shouted something very rude at her, but Miss Short did not hear. Now, children, she said briskly, 
Let's get out our math books, shall we? And though Arthur felt very indignant, he hesitated to say any more. Meanwhile, Tum Tum and Nutmeg huddled in the bottom of Arthur's satchel, their brains spinning. The town was ten miles away. If the general was taken there to be sold, he would never be seen again. We must think of something, Nutmeg cried. We will, darling, Tum Tum said, but he was feeling a deep foreboding. Saturday was the day after tomorrow. They had, they had little time. He squeezed his wife's paw, trying not to show his fear. Oh, think, Tum Tum, think, Nutmeg pleaded. And they did. There they were in Arthur's satchel, thinking all through the math lesson, then all through the English lesson, too. And then they thought all through the spelling test, and when the bell rang for break, they were still thinking so hard they both jumped, but they still hadn't thought of a plan. They waited until the children had gone outside, less noisily than usual, for they were all subdued at the thought of losing their pets. Then, as soon as the room was quiet, the nut mouses climbed out of the satchel and ran toward the cage. The gerbils tossed down the ladder, and when Tum Tum and Nutmeg appeared, they all threw themselves against the bars, clamoring for help. Do something, Mr. and Mrs. Nutmouse, they cried. If they split up our whole family, we'll be destroyed. We'll never see each other again. You must help us. You're our only hope. Tum Tum and Nutmeg tried to reassure them, but the situation was very bleak. The only consolation was that the general appeared to be back to his old self again. He had stopped his boo-hooing and instead was standing with one foot on the feeding trough, spitting with rage. A pet shop, he fumed. A pet shop? How dare that wretched woman presume to dispatch the great General Marchmouse to a pet shop? Tum Tum turned to him as a sudden as a sudden inspiration struck. Do you think it might be worth calling in the Royal Mouse Army, General? He asked. They could launch an attack on the janitor next time he opens the cage. The gerbils all pricked up their ears at the mention of the Royal Mouse Army, but the general was dismissive. Pa, do you imagine I hadn't thought of that already? He snorted. I am confident, of course, that the Royal Mouse Army would rend every soldier it could muster to rescue me, but there's no point trying to summon it. All the troops are undergoing a re week's intensive pogo training at Apple Farm. It's nearly two miles away. They'd never get back here in time. And besides, he went on, there's nothing the army could do against the janitor. He's huge. If you fired a cannonball at him, he wouldn't even feel it. That was probably true, for the Royal Mouse Army's cannonballs were the size of raisins. At this, one ray of hope was extinguished. The gerbils looked even more wretched. Some were hugging each other, now, so now and sobbing, dreading the parting to come. Meanwhile, Tum Tum and Nutmeg went on thinking. But even after thinking for another three whole minutes, which is a long time in a mouse's life, they still hadn't, hadn't thought of what to do. Chapter 9 Eventually, just as Nutmeg was thinking she could think no more, an extraordinary idea began to play itself out in her mind. She squeezed her eyes tightly shut, feeling a shiver run down her spine. I've a brainstorm, she announced. What is it, dear? Tum Tum asked eagerly. Nutmeg's brainstorm were not always sensible, but they were often spectacular and he felt they were all in need of something spectacular just now. We must summon Miss Tiptoe's ballet school, Nutmeg said. Everyone looked bewildered. They had all heard of Miss Tiptoe's ballet school, of course, for it was the most famous ballet school in the land. It was situated in the church vestry, and smart young mice came from far and wide to board there for a term or two. 
If you went to a mouse ball, you could always tell the mice who had been trained by Miss Tiptoe, because they moved around the dance floor much more gracefully than anyone else. But what possible use could Miss Tiptoe and her ballerinas be against the giant janitor? The ballet school, Mrs. Nutmouse, the general said witheringly. I suppose this is your idea of a joke. Oh no, general, I wouldn't joke at a time like this, Nutmeg replied excitedly. Our only hope of setting you all free is to get hold of the key to the padlock. But Tum Tum and I can't do that if the janitor's wearing the key ring on his belt. Yes, yes, the general interrupted. So how will your dancers save the day? Just listen, Nutmeg said impatiently. You said that the janitor removes the key ring in order to open the padlock. So that's when we must snatch it. But Tum Tum and I could never do it alone. We wouldn't be strong enough. And even if we managed to tug it in, tug it from the janitor's hands, he'd catch us before we could run away with it. <clears throat> but imagine if Miss Tiptoe's ballerinas were assembled in the wings, hiding behind a desk or a waste paper basket, and imagine if each ballerina was mounted on a pogo stick, waiting until the janitor came to unlock the stage, and then imagine if they all bounced ex silently toward him on their sticks, bouncing higher and higher until they were bouncing so high that they could snatch the keys from his hands and bounce away with them. I've seen Miss Tiptoe's ballerinas perform in the church, and they're so nimble and light-footed that the janitor would hardly know what had happened until it was all over. Everyone looked stunned. Nutmeg's proposal was so extraordinary that it took a while for it to sink in. They tried to picture the incredible scene she had described. A troop of tiny ballerinas ambushing the colossal janitor. Could it really work? The gerbils weren't sure, weren't at all sure. They had to believe in it. It was their only hope. I think it's a splendid plan, one of them declared. Quite splendid, quite ingenious. I wish I'd thought of it myself. This was all the encouragement the other gerbils needed. With a great roar of approval, they rose to their feet and started cheering. Hooray for Mrs. Nutmouse! Tum Tum clapped his wife on the back, feeling very proud. But the general still looked scornful. If the janitor's keys were snatched, he'd run after them, he said. The ballerinas wouldn't stand a chance. You underestimate them, General, Nutmeg said. Miss Tiptoe's mice are the nimblest in England. They're so light, they can almost fly. When they've snatched the key ring, they'll drag it into the corner of the room before the janitor has recovered his wits. Tum Tum and I will be waiting for them, and we can unlock the key to the cage. He's got hundreds of keys on his belt. How will you know which it is? The general asked. It's the small green one, one of the gerbils replied. He paints his keys different colors so he can tell one from the other. Good. And when we've removed it, we'll tie the key ring to the girl's pogo sticks. Nutmeg went on eagerly. Then the entire dance troupe will bounce out into the corridor with the bunch of keys clattering behind them. While the janitor runs after them, Tum Tum and I will climb up the ladder and unlock the cage. But what if the janitor catches the ballerinas? Tum Tum asked, voicing everyone's worst fear. He won't, Nutmeg answered firmly. They will move much too fast for him, especially if they are on pogo sticks. As soon as we've opened the cage, we'll sound the all clear. Then the ballerinas can simply drop the keys and bounce back into the playground through the air vent. Where do you intend to get a hold of the pogo sticks? The general asked, determined to find some hitch in Nutmeg's plan. You said the Royal Mouse Army had a big supply of them. We'll borrow some from the barracks, she replied. 
Surely they're unlikely to refuse if you write us a letter, letter of authorization. The general considered all this for a moment, stroking his whiskers. He supposed it might just work, and it was certainly better than having no plan at all. And yet something about it made him uneasy. The truth was that his pride had been deeply wounded by his imprisonment, and the thought of being rescued by ballerinas was more than he could bear. Imagine if one of the gerbils snitched about it to the village. He'd be a laughing stock. But as he mulled things over, a more cheerful picture began to appear. Perhaps it needn't be so humiliating as long as I take sole command, he mused. I might be behind the bars, but I can still issue orders, and I can still take all the credit if it works. Why, this could turn out to be one of my greatest battles yet. The general felt a quiet flutter in his stomach. How impressed everyone would be if he won. In his mind's eye, he could already see his picture on the front page of the Mouse Times, accompanied by a glorious report. The great General Marchmouse conquers all against all odds. He escapes, Houdini style, from a gerbil's cage and sends a giant school janitor fleeing for his life. The involvement of Miss Tiptoe's ballerinas could be glossed over entirely. How soon can the dancers be mobilized? he asked. We shall have to find out, Tum Tum replied, relieved that his wife's plan had been accepted. Nutmeg and I have got a lot to do. First we must get to the barracks and collect the pogo sticks. Then we'll go and see Miss Tiptoe and persuade her to lend us her dancers, and that mightn't be easy. It's a risky enterprise, and she'll probably have grave misgivings about them taking part. Not when she learns that it is my freedom that's at stake, the general said grandly. Tum Tum ignored this and looked at his watch. It was nearly twenty past eleven. The children would be returning from break at any moment. We must go at once, he said, turning to his wife. With not a moment to spare, the nut mouses quickly shimmied down to the floor. And just as the gerbils were whisking the ladder back into the cage, the door burst open and the members of room 2B started pouring into the room. We'll be back tonight, Tum Tum called over his shoulder as he and, Tum and Nutmeg hurtled behind Miss Short's desk and under cover of a filing cabinet. They waited until the children were all seated and had their heads in their books, and then they crept out under the door and across the corridor toward the air vent. Bring me my field glasses and my compass and my pistol and my whiskey flask and my military uniform and something decent to eat, the general called after them, but the nut mouses were already gone. The general would have been tickled to know that Arthur and Lucy had spent the whole of break time thinking about him. As soon as the bell rang, Arthur had rushed into the playground to find his sister and tell her all about Miss Short's plans. As he had expected, Lucy thought it all just as unfair as he did. It's as bad and it's bad enough her selling the gerbils. But she's got no right to sell our mouse, she said crossly. We brought him here thinking she would, he would have a happy home. But if he goes to the pet shop, he might end up with someone horrible, someone who forgets to feed him. When they had found the mouse in the dollhouse, they had not felt nearly as protective of him as they did now. They had just been annoyed that he had made so much mess and that he had eaten nutmeg's biscuits. But when they had seen him looking so unhappy in the gerbil's cage, they had felt a pang of remorse, thinking it might have been kinder to have kept him at Rose Cottage. And now that he was to be sent away forever, they felt even worse. 
What will happen if he goes to the pet shop and no one buys him? Arthur asked. I suppose he might be put down, Lucy said glumly. Put down? Arthur whispered, not liking the sound of this. What do you mean, put down? What oh, I... Well, it means that sometimes unwanted animals are, well, that they're done away with. Yep. Um, oh, I don't know, Lucy replied, not wanting to upset him further. I just mean we must rescue him before something awful happens. How can we rescue him if we can't open the cage? Arthur asked. The janitor's got the keys. Well, we can just ask him to open it then, Lucy said, not knowing what else to suggest. He opened it when we wanted to put the mouse in the cage, after all. I know, but he's not going to let us take him out again without Miss Short's permission, Arthur said defeatedly, and Lucy knew it was right. Well, we should tell Nutmeg then, Lucy said, and ask her to come to school and rescue him for us. Do you think she'll come all this way? Arthur asked doubtfully. Somehow, he didn't like the idea of Nutmeg coming to his school. She was their secret, and he felt they should keep her to themselves. Of course she would, Lucy said confidently. The school is not far from Rose Cottage, after all, and she can come at night when there's no one here. I suppose so, Arthur said, but he still felt uneasy. Later that day, before going to bed, he and Lucy sat down and wrote a long letter to Nutmeg, telling her all about Miss Short's plan to sell their mouse, and asking her to return him to Rose Cottage. If you bring him home again, we'll find him a nice big bucket to live in, and we'll let him out for runs in the bath. We'd look after him very well, they concluded. Meanwhile, Nutmeg's day had been most eventful. After leaving the school, she and Tum Tum had made straight for the Royal Mouse Army's barracks to see if they could borrow some pogo sticks. They needed thirteen, for Miss Tiptoe always had thirteen ballerinas in her school. It was something she was very particular about. The barracks were on the other side of the village park in a dugout underneath the war memorial. It had formerly been a fox's lair, but the Royal Mouse Army had taken it over some years ago, and now it was a warren of underground dormitories and ammunition stores. Tum Tum and Nutmeg arrived at the main entrance to find two sentries playing poker. When Tum Tum showed them General Marchmouse's letter requesting that the pogo sticks be released immediately, they were not at all helpful. One said that all the pogo sticks were locked in a storeroom and that he didn't know where to find the key. The other said he thought he might know where the key was, but that he couldn't go and look for it because he had a sprained ankle. And then the other one said he had a sprained ankle too, at which both sentries started cackling. Tum Tum became exasperated. Now look here, he said. Crossly, I happen to be on lunching terms with your commanding officer, Brigadier Flashmouse, and suddenly both the sentries became more cooperative. One offered Tum Tum a slug of whiskey from his hip flask, while the other went inside and returned with thirteen pogo sticks, each with the Royal Mouse Army's initials, RMA, engraved near the tip. Tum Tum signed for them, then the nut mouses hurried on their way. They made straight for the ballet school, crossing the lane at the top of the green, then climbing up the steep verge that led into the churchyard. Hang on, Tum Tum said, suddenly noticing three women coming up the church path with bundles of flowers. He and Nutmeg waited until they had gone into the porch, then followed behind. There were more women inside the church, arranging big bouquets of lilies, but they were concentrating much too hard on their work to notice two mice 
scuttling down the aisle toward the vestry. The entrance to Miss Tiptoe's school was through a little mouse hole, hidden behind an old oak chest. There was no door, just a frayed velvet curtain to keep out the draft. The nut mouses dumped the pogo sticks on the floor and went inside. The school was in a big, chilly cupboard with dark red walls and a flagstone floor. Long ago, it was where all the church silver had been kept. But then the silver had been sold and the cupboard wasn't needed anymore, so Miss Tiptoe had taken it over. The school was lit by candles borrowed from the church, which gave only a dim light, and it took a moment or two for Tum Tum and Nutmeg's eyes to become accustomed to the gloom. They could just make out the ballerinas in the far corner, practicing at the bar. All thirteen were present, dressed in white tutus, with gold braids in their hair. Miss Tiptoe was sitting next to them at the piano, playing soft, tinkling tunes. Nutmeg knew the piano, sorry, Tum Tum knew the piano well. It had once lived in the drawing room of Nutmouse Hall, but he had not, but he had given it to Miss Tiptoe when her last piano had got dry rot. Dry rot. Uh, it's when the wood starts to, to go bad. Miss Tiptoe's pianos often got dry rot, for the cupboard was rather damp. The nut, nut mouses waited until Miss Tiptoe had finished playing before approaching her. She was surprised to see them, for mice seldom visit her school unannounced. But their expressions clearly told her that something was wrong. Take a rest, girls, she instructed her class. Then she got up and led the nut mouses to her desk, which stood in a corner of the cupboard raised on a red hymn book. She walked with a stick, but her back was as straight as a ruler. She sat on a big throne-like chair, while the nut mouses faced her perched on tiny embroidered footstools. Miss Tiptoe was very beautiful and composed, and everyone found her a little intimidating. She was tall and thin and gray, and astonishingly old. No one knew how old, but one of Nutmeg's sisters had been taught by her when she was a young girl, and she had seemed very old then, and now, of course, she was even older. She listened silently while Tum Tum told her all about the general's capture, and explained the amazing role they had hoped they hoped her ballerinas might play in his and the gerbil's release. The nut mouses had expected that she might be shocked at their request, but she had a calm, wise expression on her face. Miss Tiptoe had seen many odd things in her life, and she knew the strange and wonderful plots of all the classical ballets, so it took a lot to surprise her. I'm, uh, I'm sure your ballerinas would look most elegant on pogo sticks, Miss Tiptoe, Tum Tum concluded, feeling rather awkward. Miss Tiptoe looked at him piercingly. Imagine that you were in my position, Mr. Nutmouse, she said, speaking in a very clear voice. Would you risk your pupils' lives for the sake of the general? Tum Tum said nothing, but his silence was as good as an answer as any. For, of course, he knew that if he had a daughter, he wouldn't want her risking her life on account of anyone. Miss Tiptoe's expression softened. Is the general a close friend of yours, Mr. Nutmouse? she asked kindly. I suppose he is, Tum Tum replied. I know he can be exasperating and is a bit above himself, but there is a side to him which is good and loyal, too. And he is a great hero, of course. Miss Tiptoe nodded. She did not know the general well, but like all the mice in the village, she felt a certain loyalty to him. For whenever there had been trouble, such as when rats had invaded the village grain store, he and his troops had always risen to save the day. So now that it was his hour of need, was it fair to, to desert him? She looked pensive for a moment, but she was still wavering 
her fortune was still wavering, but her conscience told her what to do. Bring your pogo sticks inside, Mr. Nutmouse, she said calmly. My ballerinas will do what is required of them. Tum Tum and Nutmeg both let out a cry of relief. Oh, thank you, Miss Tiptoe, thank you. Nutmeg gulped, looking up, or leaping up to embrace her. By the time Nutmeg had found her feet, Miss Tiptoe had already glided back to her pupils. Come along now, girls, she cried, wrapping her stick on the floor. We have a new routine to rehearse. Chapter 11 None of the ballerinas had used a pogo stick before, but they took to them at once, leaping into the air as gracefully as gazelles, with Miss Tiptoe accompanying them on the piano. Before long, they were bouncing so high they could touch the cupboard ceiling. When she felt they could bounce no better, Miss Tiptoe sent the girls off to have tea, which was served next door in a flower bin in the vicarage kitchen. Oh, Miss Tiptoe, they were splendid, cried Nutmeg, who had been watching spellbound. Miss Tiptoe smiled graciously. Then she listened as Tum Tum spelled out the plan of attack. We'll come back early in the morning and escort you and your girls to room 2B before the school opens, he began. That way you can familiarize yourselves with the classroom and take instructions from the general before any of the children turn up. Then you can find somewhere to hide away until the janitor comes on his lunchtime rounds. It will be a long wait, but it's important that all the dancers are out of sight before school begins. Miss Tiptoe raised her eyes when Tum Tum mentioned taking instructions from the general, but she made no comment. I will entrust you with the refreshments, Mrs. Nutmouse, was all she said. If my girls are to spend all morning cooped up underneath the filing cabinet, they will need something to nibble. Of course, Nutmeg replied eagerly, and she at once began planning a sumptuous picnic. By the time the nut mouses left the vestry, the flower arrangers had long gone. The lights had been turned off, and the church was almost dark. As they walked back down the aisle, hand in hand, they heard the clock strike five. Five o'clock, Tum Tum, Nutmeg sighed, and we've so and we've so much to do. I have to prepare the picnic, and then we'll have to go back to the school and tell the general what's happening. And there is no need to go back to the school tonight, Tum Tum said firmly. We've a busy day tomorrow, and we must go home and rest. We'll see the general first thing in the morning. The thought of rest was very tempting to Nutmeg, for all the excitement was beginning to take its toll on her. Her eyes fell heavy, and her ankles were starting to ache. As they walked home to Nutmouse Hall, she leaned wearily on Tum Tum's shoulder. They had only been away for a day, and yet the house had a deserted feel to it. The big rooms seemed empty and echoey now that the general had gone. Nutmeg felt quite forlorn as she set about in the kitchen making a meatloaf and a mushroom quiche and a salmon mousse and a lemon cheesecake and two dozen jam tarts for the ballerinas. While she worked, Tum Tum put his feet up in the library. He felt forlorn too. What if our plan doesn't work? Nutmeg said anxiously as they finally sat down together to suffer in the kitchen. It will work, dear, Tum Tum replied reassuringly. You saw how high those ballerinas could hop on their pogo sticks. They'll have no difficulty bouncing up and snatching the janitor's keys. But what if he catches them? Nutmeg fretted. Oh, those poor young girls. If he were to hurt them, I'd never forgive myself. Now don't fuss, dear. Tum Tum said, 
They'll be bouncing so fast the janitor won't even see them coming. I do. Yeah, yeah. They will. They are very small. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Yeah, very tiny. Um, I do hope you're right, Nutmeg said, but she could feel a dread rising in her stomach. It had been her idea to enlist the help of the ballet school, and it had seemed such a splendid idea at first, and yet as the time of the rescue operation drew nearer, she had a horrible feeling that something was to go terribly wrong, or horribly wrong. Perhaps the general was right, she thought. Perhaps the ballerinas simply aren't up to it. Nutmeg worried all through supper, and then she worried while she washed up. And she was still worrying when she and Tum Tum sat down in the library to drink their cocoa. She knew it, she, she would never get to sleep, so she decided to go and tidy Arthur and Lucy's bedroom. I don't want them thinking I'm neglecting them, and this morning I noticed that Lucy's sweater needs darning, she said when Tum Tum protested, and I still haven't cleared up all the mess the general made in the dollhouse. Very well, dear, but don't be long, Tum Tum said, stifling a yawn. We both need an early night, and you've already done quite enough bustling for one day. But when Nutmeg reached the attic, she found the children's letter, and that made her even more anxious, for even if she managed to get the general back from the school, she knew she couldn't possibly let Arthur and Lucy keep him in a bucket. He wouldn't like that at all. She sat a long while at her desk in the dollhouse, nibbling the end of her fountain pen and wondering how best to reply. The letter she wrote, when fi finally wrote, went as follows. Dear Arthur and Lucy, I intend to rescue your mouse tomorrow. This will be a very difficult mission and I cannot guarantee that I will succeed, but if I do, perhaps it would, it would be best if we were to set him free again. For I happen to know the mouse in question, and I doubt he would much enjoy living in a bucket. Love, Nutmeg. Then, while the children slept, she darned the elbow of Lucy's sweater and the toe of one of Arthur's socks, and she scrubbed the dollhouse kitchen and put all the furniture back to rights in the living room. And finally, feeling more tired than she could ever remember, she limped back to Nutmouse Hall and collapsed beside Tum Tum in their four-poster bed. Everyone in Rose Cottage slept soundly that night, but there was no such peace for the general. After the nutmouses had left him, his day had gone from bad to worse. After break, there had been a nature lesson conducted by a gangly teacher called Mr. Greaves, who had asked the class questions such as what field mice do in winter and where squirrels sleep at night. The general had shouted all the answers loud and clear from his cage, but the teacher had ignored him. Then there had been a math lesson, during which the children had recited their times tables. The gerbils turned out to know them all perfectly, but when the general tried to join in, he'd gotten the most dreadful muddle and said that three times three was thirty-three and that six times six was sixty-six. And then his cellmates had mocked him all the more. By the time the children filed off for lunch, the general was feeling more homesick than he'd ever felt before. Even when he'd been away at war for whole days on end, he had never felt as homesick as this. Then the janitor had turned up to give the prisoners more revolting seeds to eat, and the general felt sicker than ever. There was something off-putting about the janitor. He was so tall he had to stoop almost double to open the door of the cage, and his fist was so wide and when he reached inside to dump the food in the feeding trough, the animals had to press themselves back against the bars so as to not be crushed. He was a curious-looking man, too, with thick tufts of black hair coming from his nostrils and red veins in his cheeks. The general made clear his displeasure at the luncheon being served. "'Take away this 
filthy birdseed and bring me some decent roast beef, he shouted. But the janitor just slammed the cage door shut on him. How do how can you digest that muck? The general asked sullenly, watching the gerbils crowd around the trough. But it had been a whole day since they had last eaten, and the gerbils were too busy eating to reply. As the afternoon wore on with a history lesson, followed by a spelling test to which the gerbils recited all the correct answers, and he all the wrong ones, the general began to feel more and more wretched, and then a new crisis arose. Shortly after the children had gone home, the janitor appeared at the door of room 2B. He found Miss Short in the room, tidying her desk. Can I lock up in here now? he asked her. Yes, I'm just going, and I'll be taking these beastly things with me, she said, nodding toward the cage. I was going to get rid of them on Saturday, but I'm seeing my sister in town tonight, so I might as well take them now. What'll you do with them? the janitor asked casually. I'll take them to the pet shop, she replied. I wouldn't do that, he said. I know old Mr. Dye who runs it, and he won't be wanting a cage full of flea-bitten old rodents like this. He sells fancy things, carp and budgies and the like. Miss Short sucked in her breath. Well, if the pet shop can take them, I'll have to think again, she said crisply. I'm sure the vet could, dis could dispose of them for me. At this, the gerbils let out a collective cry of horror and started scrabbling frantically, desperate to get out, while the general clutched the bars, swearing furiously at his captors. Then the floor lurched beneath their feet as the cage was hoisted into the air. Chapter 12 Tumtum -tum and Nutmeg set out early next morning to collect the ballerinas. The milkman had not yet stirred, and the church spire was still shrouded in mist. When they arrived in the vestry, they found Miss Tiptoe and her class waiting for them outside the cupboard. The girls were dressed in beige tutus, which had their names embroidered on them in silver thread. The nut mouses, studying them a moment, so that they might remember who was who. There was Trixie Bell, who had the long, beautiful ears. There was Millicent Millie Bobette, who was the shortest. There was Lily Loop, who was the tallest. There was Horseradish, with the pink braids in her tail. And Tar Tar, with sharp silver toenails. But it was no good. They could never remember so many names. Just trying made their heads spin. And they were such odd names, too. And in their day, mice had been given simple names like Nutmeg. You told me that the school had wooden floors, so I decided beige would be our best disguise, Miss Tiptoe said. She had been up all night sewing. How clever of you, Nutmeg replied. She suddenly felt embarrassed by the bright green cape she was wearing and wished she had dressed more discreetly. Presently, the party set forth. They were a curious convoy, with the girls bouncing along like crickets on their pogo sticks and Miss Tiptoe gliding elegantly beside them, while Tum Tum and Nutmeg straggled in the rear with the picnic baskets. The girls were in high spirits, and Horseradish shrieked when Tartar tried to bounce away with her earmuffs. Young ladies, please recall that you are re representing my ballet school, Miss Tiptoe said sharply, and they all looked a little chastened. Before long, they reached the school gates and saw the playground stretching before them. The girls all craned their necks as they looked up at the vast steel climbing frame. 
To them, it seemed as tall as a skyscraper. This way, Tum Tum said, leading the party toward the air vent. He pushed the pogo sticks through the grill first, then the mice climbed inside. The ballerinas had never been in a school for human children, and the building felt cold and unfamiliar. They found something ominous about the huge shoes in the lockers and the enormous overalls hanging from the pegs on the wall. It was all so different from their own, their own little school in the vestry. They kept close together as they followed Tum Tum under the door of room 2B. It was dark, for the blinds were shut, and they couldn't see as far as the cage. Everything was deathly quiet. The prisoners must still be asleep, Tum Tum said, leading his party across the room. Gerbils, gerbils, we're back, he called up from beneath the table. Throw down the ladder. But there wasn't a sound. He called again, wondering why they didn't reply. Then blinking, Nutmeg let out a cry. The cage! It's gone! The nut mouses stood motionless, stunned by this discovery. They couldn't understand it. Miss Short had said that she was taking the gerbils to the pet shop on Saturday, but Saturday wasn't until tomorrow. The cage must have been moved to another part of the school, Tum Tum said urgently. We'll search all the classrooms. Miss Tiptoe, you and the girls head down the corridor to your left and look under every door. We'll try the rooms to the right. The mice hurtled back out of room 2B and dispersed down the corridor, shouting the general's name. Miss Tiptoe's ballerinas bounced high and low around the gymnasium, the art room, and the kitchen, and the nut mouses scuttled around room 3A and room 1C and all around the staff room and the music room, but the cage was nowhere to be seen. He must have gone to the pet shop, Nutmeg wailed. She had a sudden vision of Mrs. Marchmouse living the rest of her life alone in the big rackety gun cupboard with no one to keep her company, and she started to weep. I will take my girls back to the vestry, since it seems there is no use for us here, Miss Tiptoe said tactfully. The subdued rescue party made its way back down the corridor toward the air vent. The girls walked quietly, pulling their pogo sticks behind them. None of them had met the general before, but the, thoughts, uh, the thought of any mouse being taken to a pet shop was enough to take all the bounce out of them. But just as they were about to climb back outside, Tum Tum suddenly stopped in his tracks. What's that? he said, motioning to the, the party to be still. They all stood quivering, their ears pricked. They could hear faint squeals. Over there! They're in there! Tum Tum cried, pointing to the cupboard door across the corridor. Miss Tiptoe's dancers had passed by it. They'd all they'd looked in all the classrooms, but they hadn't thought of exploring the cupboards, too. As Tum Tum wriggled under the door, he could hear the gerbils howling, and rising above them was the voice of a most indignant General Marchmouse. We're in here, you fools! Let us out! Let us out! Where? Tum Tum shouted, fumbling for his flashlight. It's pitch black. I can't see a thing. Here! squeaked a dozen voices. Here! Where? Tum Tum called again. Up here! they chorused impatiently. Tum Tum craned his neck and shone his flashlight back and forth along the shelves. At first, all he could see were, the, were cardboard boxes. But then, on the lowest shelf off the ground, he noticed a big lump covered with a filthy gray blanket. He shone his flashlight over it, trying to make out what it was. All of a sudden, the corner of the blanket tweaked 
and the straw ladder came tumbling to the floor. Quick, I have found them, Tum Tum shouted under the door. The rest of the mice raced after him, and they all clambered up to the prisoners. Uncover us, the general shouted furiously, and with the nut mouses and Miss Tiptoe and the thirteen ballerinas pulling and tugging as one, they eventually managed to drag the blanket from the cage. When Tum Tum shone his light on the prisoners, it was clear that there had been quite a commotion. The exercise wheel had been snapped in two, and, event and everyone was badly bruised. The general had a black eye and was in, in especially ill humor. "'Why the devil didn't you come back last night?' he asked furious, furiously. "'We've been sentenced to death, every one of us!' Each prisoner had a different version of what had happened, and everyone talked at once, so the story was rather hard to follow." but it seemed that after Miss Short's threat to transport them all to the vet, the general had become quite wild with anger, and when she'd picked up the cage, he'd sunk his teeth deep into her finger, drawing blood, or biting it, um, or biting it right off, depending whose account you believed. Miss Short had then dropped the cage on the floor, and it had landed with a great crash which is what had caused all the cuts and bruises and black eyes. She had shrieked a great deal, using words that had made the lady gerbils cover their ears, but the upshot was that she was too frightened to go near the cage again, and she had told the janitor that she would not take it in her car, nor did she want it to remain in room 2B. So the janitor had offered to get rid of it, saying that he would dispose of the gerbils over the weekend. Miss Short had not inquired how he intended to do this, but he had muttered something about having a friend who kept owls, and that had made all the prisoners quake, for they all knew that owls liked nothing more than a succulent little mouse or gerbil to nibble. And then the janitor had dumped them in the dark cupboard out of Miss Short's sight. She, he had thrown the blanket over them in order to muffle their protests, and left them to await their terrifying fate. "'The worst of it was thinking you'd never find us, Mrs. Nutmouse,' one of the gerbils said pitifully. Nutmeg said nothing, for she was terrified that her plan might no longer work. It wouldn't be nearly so easy now that the cage was in a cupboard instead of the classroom, and besides, the janitor's routine might have changed.' There was no knowing what time he'd come and feed the gerbils now, or if he would come at all. Our plan will still succeed so long as everyone follows my commands to the letter, the general said bossily, reading her thoughts. Then he looked at Tum Tum and started giving orders. You and all the dancers must hide on the other side of the corridor, under the shoe lockers, until the janitor comes to feed us, he said. When he opens the door and removes the keys from his belt, I'll give the order to hop, but nobody is to move until I issue it. When do you think the janitor will come? Tum Tum asked. Oh, I don't know, the general snapped. But if he wants to feed us to the owls, then it's in his interest to fatten us up. I shouldn't think he'll come soon enough. Very good, general, Tum Tum said, looking at his watch. We'd better hurry up and hide. It's nearly eight o'clock, and the school will be opening soon. We're starving, one of the gerbils said. Did you bring us anything to eat? Oh, I don't think you'll be short of things to eat, Tum Tum said, shining his flashlight over the labels on the cardboard boxes. You've been locked up in the school's candy cupboard. Chapter 13 There was a great whoop of joy from the gerbils when they read the words on the boxes. They had been locked away with a lifetime supply of lemon drops, candy bars, lollipops, and potato chips. Even the general managed to cheer when he saw the enormous carton of chocolates. The nut mouses spent a frantic few minutes nibbling through all the cardboard packaging and distributing the food. 
Tum Tum pulled out a bar of hazelnut chocolate and passed chunks into the cage. Then he wrestled the cap off a tube of Smarties and showered them down onto the prisoners. Nutmeg handed them chips and gumdrops and long strands of strawberry licorice. The ballerinas were looking longingly at a box of jelly beans, for it seemed an eternity since breakfast. But Miss Tiptoe did not approve of sweets and promptly shooed them all back down the ladder. When the prisoners had been given all they could eat, the nut mouses scurried down after the others. Then the mice lay in wait on the other side of the corridor beneath the long row of lockers. A few moments later, a bright light came on, and they felt the floor quake as the children charged into the building. The ballerinas huddled together, watching the huge feet thundering by. One of the children stopped just in front of them to hang up her coat, and the tips of her shoes poked under the locker, brushing horseradish's tutu. Then suddenly a bell clanged, and the children disappeared into their classrooms. After that, the mice had a long, anxious wait for the janitor to appear. The hideaway was cramped and dusty, and had it not been for their picnic, they would have felt very glum. Arthur was having an uneasy time, too. The moment he had walked into box or room 2B, <laughs> he noticed the empty table where the cage had been and felt a sense of foreboding. Where have the gerbils gone? he asked Miss Short, who was sitting at her desk eating a jelly sandwich. I will explain to you when we are all sitting down, she replied annoyingly. It seemed a very long wait until everyone had settled, and Miss Short had gone through the attendance sheet. Now, children, she said eventually, speaking with forced Daddy. cheerfulness. <laughs> yes. Some of you may have noticed that our large family of gerbils is no longer with us. Where have they gone? They all cried. They have been... Removed, Miss Short replied. She spoke as though referring to something distasteful, like a rotten egg. And I will tell you why, she continued, raising her voice as the children bombarded her with more questions. Last night I learned that our gerbils were not the timid creatures we assumed them to be. One of them bit me. Miss Short paused a moment while this information, information sank in. To force the point, she raised the first finger of her left hand to show off a small bandage. How come? Arthur asked suspiciously, for he knew that Miss Short never went near the cage. It bit me when I tried to give it something nice to eat, Miss Short lied, and when I discovered how dangerous the little creatures were, I knew I must remove them at once, for we wouldn't want any of you being injured, would we? I didn't dare put the cage in my car, so the janitor kindly agreed to deliver the animals to the pet shop for me. Has he taken them there already? Arthur asked anxiously. I certainly hope so, Miss Short said. I have told him that I do not wish to see them inside the school building ever. Again, the children were shocked by this development, and they felt that the story didn't quite add up. But when they pressed Miss Short for more information, she got angry and told them that they, she never wanted to hear any mention of the beastly gerbils again. Arthur was so upset he couldn't concentrate on any of his lessons. Yes. Well, I think she, he just didn't want to be taken to the pet shop. Yeah. Well, he would knew that he would never see his wife again if he if he was. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Arthur was so upset he couldn't concentrate on any of his lessons. <laughs>
Then at break time, he rushed to find Lucy on the playground to tell her what had happened. So she hopes the janitor's already taken them. But she didn't say he definitely had, he explained. But he must have, Lucy said miserably. They're not in any of the classrooms, and they can't be in the staff room, because Miss Short said she didn't want to see them again. The children sat down together on the bench beside the basketball court, feeling wretched. They wished they had never brought their mouse to school. We could go to, ta go to the town, find the pet shop, and buy him back, Arthur suggested. But even as he said it, he knew it wouldn't work, for the town was ten miles away and their father had no car to take them there. Besides, which they had only eighty-eight pence between them, and a mouse would surely cost more than that. They felt so downcast that it was almost a relief when the bell rang to mark the end of break. But as they were making their way back inside, they saw the janitor walking toward them. He had come from the direction of the shed in the corner of the playground, where he kept all his things. He was carrying a brown sack. That's the gerbil's food, Arthur said in surprise. I've seen him with it before. Come on, let's follow him and see where he goes. The children waited until he had gone inside, then crept after him down the corridor. But halfway along it, he disappeared into the boiler room. Surely he can't be feeding the gerbils in there, Lucy said, thinking it a very odd place to hide them. They waited outside, pretending to be looking for something in one of the lockers. They should have been back at their classrooms by now, but they just but they had to see what happened. Presently the janitor reappeared, still carrying the brown sack. The children watched motionless as he walked on down the corridor, then stopped outside the candy cupboard. He stood there a moment, glancing left and right. He looked nervous, as if he didn't want anyone to see what, what he was doing. Then he removed the keys from his belt and opened the cupboard door. As he did so, the nut mouses and Miss Tiptoe hovered at the rim of the locker, watching his every move. The ballerinas were lined up behind them, mounted on their pogo sticks, poised to advance the moment the general gave the order. On your marks, girls, they heard him bellow from inside the cage. Get set! Charge! But just as the order was given, Nutmeg issued a counter command. Stop! Stop! She shrieked, pointing down the corridor. Tum Tum, look! It's Arthur and Lucy. We can't let them see us. Hold back, girls, Tum Tum shouted. The janitor fumbled a hand inside the cupboard, trying to find the light switch. He could hear lots of rattling and squealing as General Marchmouse roared commands and shook the bars in the most dreadful rage. Charge! Charge! the general cried, but Tum Tum was still holding the ballerina's back. How dare you disobey my orders! the general shouted. At that moment, there was a sudden clack of high heels, and Miss Short appeared. As she walked past the candy cupboard, the janitor looked over his shoulder shiftily, but she took no notice of him. Arthur, Lucy, what are you doing here? she asked crossly. Break ended five minutes ago. The children at once hurried off to their classrooms, and then Miss Short disappeared into the staff room. Finally, the coast was clear. Charge! The general shouted again, and this time, the mice did. The janitor was still fumbling for the light switch when the ballerinas sprang be from beneath the locker and began bouncing toward him. 
they moved in perfect unison and made not the slightest sound. It was like a silent ballet, with Miss Tiptoe conducting unseen from the rear. The general was issuing commands through the bars. Go! Ambush him now! Stop squeaking, the janitor muttered, finally finding the switch. As he turned on the light, the ballerinas all balanced straight for him on their pogo sticks, soaring like a flock of birds toward the huge key ring on his, in his hand. The nut mouses and Miss Tiptoe shook with fear, but the dancers were much too agile for the janitor. As they rose into the air, they raised their left paws from their pogo sticks and grabbed at the keys as they sailed by, jerking them from his hand. The whole bunch crashed to the floor, with the ballerinas dropping down silent, silently behind. Before the janitor had time to look down, the ballerinas had dragged the key ring under the shelf at the back of the cupboard. The nut mouses were waiting. This one, Nutmeg cried, finding a small red key. Didn't... Right. Good memory. Didn't the gerbil say it was a green key, dear? Nutmeg asked anxiously. No, no, they said it was red, Tum Tum replied. He wrestled furiously to unhook it, sweat pouring down his nose. Oh, hurry, Tum Tum, hurry, Nutmeg squawked as the janitor got down onto his hands and knees, searching in bewilderment for his keys. He still had no idea what had hit him. Hit him. Finally, the red key fell free. Quick, divert him, Tum Tum shouted to the ballerinas. Each one of them had a long lace looped around her waist, borrowed from the shoes left in the lockers opposite. Tying one end to the key ring and attaching the other to their pogo sticks, they all bounced out of the cupboard and made off down the corridor with the keys clanking and clattering behind them. The janitor looked on in astonishment as the ballerinas bounced higher and higher and faster and faster. He thought he must be seeing things, and yet there they were, as clear as day. Thirteen mice dressed in beige tutus bouncing. By the, <clears throat> excuse me, by the time he had gathered his wits and chased after them, they had bounced nearly as far as the gymnasium. Meanwhile, the gerbils lowered the ladder, and Tum Tum and Nutmeg scrambled up with the red key. Hurry up there, the general said. What the devil is taking you so long? Come on, come on. The key was nearly as long as he was, and as Tum Tum pushed it into the padlock, his paws were shaking. He was normally such a calm mouse, but all the excitement, excitement had unnerved him. Nutmeg placed her paws on his to steady him, and together they tried to turn it in the lock. But though they wriggled it and jiggled it, it wouldn't budge. Oh, do move along, the general bu bullied, rattling the bars in frustration. The gerbils were crowded behind him, desperate to get out. But there was nothing that Nutmouses could do. We've got the wrong key, Nutmeg said in despair. The general turned green. He could hear the other keys clattering farther and farther away down the corridor, and with them his only hope of freedom. Get them back, he shouted. Tum Tum skedaddled down the ladder and ran recklessly after the ballerinas. Come back, he cried, and hearing him, they all obediently turned and raced back down the corridor, pulling the keys behind them. The girls were at Tum Tum's side in seconds. He quickly found the green key and tried to unhook it, but it was wedged tight, and he couldn't pry it off the ring. He could hear the janitor thundering back up the corridor. He would be on them in seconds. Quick! Tie the whole bunch to the ladder! 
and we'll pull them up, shouted the general, monitoring events from the cage. Trembling, Tum Tum tied the keys to the end of the straw ladder with one of the shoelaces. Then the prisoners hoisted them up to the shelf, and Miss Tiptoe and Nutmeg dragged them to the cage. This one! Nutmeg cried, finding the green key. She and Miss Tiptoe seized hold of it and heaved it up into the padlock, or the lock. Then they wrenched it clockwise, and finally the padlock gave way. But at that moment, a shadow fell over the cage, and to their horror, the animals saw the janitor peering in at them. He shot out a hand to snap the padlock shut, but the prisoners moved too fast for him. Charge! the general cried, and before the janitor could secure the lock, they all stampeded the door together, a dozen gerbils and their commanding officer bursting free with a great victorious squeal. They leaped, leaped straight onto the janitor, and started scrambling along the arms of his sweater, then cascading down the legs of his pants. He swatted at them, at them wildly, but they clung on tight. On reaching the floor, they spread into the corridor, hurtling all over the place. "'Scatter!' the general shouted. "'Run for your lives!' The plan had been to retreat through the air vent, but in his excitement the general had forgotten where it was. Chaos ensued as ballerinas and gerbils flew about the floor, while the, with the janitor trying to stamp on them with his enormous boots. The gerbils moved like tornadoes, amazed at how fast their legs could carry them after their long months in captivity. But the general was so full of chocolate that he was less nimble. "'Give me a pogo stick!' he panted, but there were none to spare." Tum Tum and Nutmeg and Miss Tiptoe crouched under a locker, looking on in dismay. They had promised the general they would follow his orders, but they couldn't understand what he was up to. The general, or the operation, had descended into chaos. Why doesn't he beat a retreat through the air vent? Tum Tum asked hopelessly. If this goes on much longer, someone's going to get trodden on. Miss Tiptoe decided to take charge. "'He is not fit to lead,' she said sharply, marching into the corridor. "'Girls, gerbils, this way, please,' she cried, pointing under the locker with her walking stick. "'Follow me through the air vent.' The girls at once obeyed and bounced straight toward her, but the gerbils dithered, their loyalties torn. For while they thought the general rather ridiculous, he was an officer, after all, and he was still telling them to scatter. But then they saw the janitor's boot looming over them, and without dithering a moment longer, they all bolted for cover. At that moment, Miss Short reappeared. They've multiplied, she shrieked, seeing the animals fleeing under the locker. And then all the classroom doors opened at once as teachers and children poured into the corridor wondering what the commotion was about. You've let them out! Miss Short raged at the janitor. The whole school will be infested! And yet, even as she spoke, the animals were all escaping through the vent, or at least all but General Marchmouse, for he was too busy shouting commands that he didn't notice the others leaving. "'It's my mouse!' Arthur cried delight delightedly, seeing the general rushing back and forth in his underpants. Yeah. Miss Short let out another streak as he darted over her shoe. "'Scatter!' the general cried again, wondering where the others had gone. "'Here, general! Follow us!' shouted Tum Tum as he helped Nutmeg wriggle out through the through the vent. "'How dare you leave the battlefield without my permission!' the general retorted. But then he looked up and noticed for the first time the huge pairs of feet, dozens of them, crowded all around him. And suddenly he didn't feel quite so brave. 
Wait for me, he whimpered and ran, <laughs> and ran full speed after the others. The children all cheered, delighted that their gerbils had escaped being sent to, to the pet, pet shop. But Miss Short was furious. You may think it funny now, but just you wait until they multiply, she snarled. No. They They've, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> they've doubled overnight. I saw at least two dozen of them, and by tomorrow there'll be four dozen, and by Monday there'll be sixteen dozen, and in a few weeks' time there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And they'll be everywhere. You'll find gerbils writhing in your shoes and burrowing in your pencil cases and nesting in your coat pockets. They'll take over your desks and your bags, and when they die, you'll find their corpses rotting in your food. Yuck. The children looked alarmed. For much as they liked their gerbils, the thought of thousands and thousands and thousands of them was rather unsettling, and the school food was disgusting enough already without dead gerbils flavoring it. For a moment, they were all silenced. But then Lucy noticed something going on outside. It looked as if there were lots of rubber balls bouncing across the playground. She turned and pressed her face to the window. It's the gerbils, she said in astonishment. They're bouncing. In fact, it was the ballerinas who were bouncing. The gerbils were running by their side. But there were, they were already too far away for Lucy to tell the difference. The children crowded around the window to look. They're on pogo sticks, one of them said. Don't be ridiculous, Miss Short snapped. Gerbils do not use pogo sticks. But the children sensed that this was not her area of expertise. And from that day on, the story of the fantastic bouncing gerbils was to become quite a legend in the village school. Yes! Yes! Fifteen. The animals ran and bounded across the playground as fast as they could, fearing that the janitor and Miss Short might come chasing after them. It was only when they were outside the school gates that they dared to look around, but the playground was empty, and there was no one coming. We've made it! Tum Tum cried, and then all the gerbils started clapping and whooping, for it isn't every day that, ger that a gerbil escapes. The ballerinas whooped too, but it was the general who seemed the most excited of all. We're free! he shouted, punching the air in triumph. The enemy has been fooled! Oh, what a brilliant campaign! When the Royal Mars Mouse Army hears about this, I shall receive another medal. I say, three cheers for Miss Tiptoe and her dancers, Tum Tum said chival chivalrous chivalrously, but the general appeared not to hear. Seeing as the mood was so festive, Nutmeg decided to invite everyone back to Nut Mouse Hall. We shall have a celebratory feast, she announced eagerly, and they all thought this was a very good idea. Especially the gerbils, for now that they had left the cage, they had no home to go to. So Tum Tum let, led the party back towards Rose Cottage. It was a slow journey, for everyone was rushing around in different directions and Miss Tiptoe kept stopping to make sure that none of her dancers had been left behind. By the time they crawled in under the garden door, it was nearly mid-afternoon. There was no one around, so Tum Tum led the party straight across the kitchen floor and under the dresser. Then he held open the gates while they all trooped into the broom cupboard. When they set eyes on Nutmouse Hall, the gerbils suddenly fell quiet. 
It was like a fairy tale house, grander than anything they had ever seen, and the sight of so many turrets and windows overwhelmed them. When Tum Tum showed them in inside, they were even more astonished, for the gerbils had lived all their lives in one room, and the cage hadn't seen much of a room, hadn't been much of a room at that. But the nut mouses had dozens of rooms, all stuffed with treasures. Wherever one looked, there were chandeliers, tapestries, pretty vases, silver candlesticks, and gilt mirrors. There was even a grand piano. It was all so splendid that the gerbils, who were still naked, felt a little out of place. But Nutmeg had an idea as to how to make them more at home. I'm afraid the house is rather chilly, she said tactfully, blowing on her paws. I think I should find you all something to wear. Something to wear? they asked nervously. The gerbils had never worn anything except the fur coats that they had been born in. The idea of clothes struck them as very strange. But Nutmeg gave them no chance to protest and promptly shooed them all upstairs for a fitting. She showed the lady gerbils into her bedroom and supplied them with pretty frocks and smart cashmere shawls. Then she took the male gerbils into Tum Tum's dressing room and found them each a fine tweed suit. Once they were dressed in the nut mouse's expensive country clothes, the gerbils began to feel much more sure of themselves. Hooray! You look much more civilized! the general said approvingly as they strutted back into the living room. He barely recognized them with, from all the scruffy little, little creatures he had shared a cage with. And the gerbils barely recognized the general, for he had not only got dressed, but had brushed his tail, blackened his eyebrows, and oiled his whiskers. When he was staying in a smart house, he always liked to look his best. The gerbils and the general had a delightful time admiring each other in the living room, and meanwhile Nutmeg set about rustling up a celebratory feast from the odds and ends in her pantry. She made a salmon mousse, a saffron risotto, a fish pie, a hash, a cockroach roulade, roula, uh, roulade, I think, <laughs> a trifle, um, a chocolate mousse, a uh, sponge pudding with a jug of hot molasses sauce to pour on top. By the time she'd finished, it was getting dark, so she served the meal by candlelight in the banqueting room, and she laid the table with all her best silver and crockery and damask table napkins. This was a little confusing for the gerbils, who until now had always eaten from a trough, but the ballerinas showed them what to do, and explained how knives were for cutting with, and forks for spearing with, and spoons for spooning with. And the gerbils picked it up. Well, it says spooning here. And the, yeah. and the gerbils picked it up so quickly that before long one could hardly tell them from the mice. Many courses later, as Nutmeg was serving coffee and mince, Tum Tum tapped his glass with a fork, signaling for quiet. Then he stood up heavily and made an announcement. Until you find somewhere to live, you must all stay here with us, he said to the gerbils, who were seated in a long line down one side of the table. We've plenty to eat and drink, and we've sixteen spare bedrooms, nine spare bathrooms, a ballroom, a library, and a schoolroom. The gerbils raised their, their glasses and cheered. They were getting so used to all this fine living that their days in captivity already seemed a distant memory. By now, everyone was in such high spirits that no one wanted the party to stop. So, after dinner, the gerbils and ballerinas danced together in the ballroom, and it was long after midnight when Miss Tiptoe finally 
took her charges back to school. Once the general and the gerbils had gone to bed, Tum Tum and Nutmeg made themselves a thermos of cocoa and went to sit in the library. They were unused to entertaining on this scale, and they were both worn out. Do you suppose the gerbils will ever move out? Nutmeg asked, collapsing onto the sofa. She had become very fond of them, but there was a part of her that longed for some peace and quiet again. I'm sure we can help them find a proper home of their own, Tum Tum replied reassuringly. Rose Cottage is much too small and crowded. There's not an, there's not an inch of space left to build in. But there are many, plenty of nooks and crannies at the manor house that they could move into. I remember the general telling me about an airing cupboard that the present owners never use. He and Mrs. Marchmouse had been going to make their home had been going to make their home in it, but they decided it was too big, so they took over the gun cupboard instead. It might be just right for the gerbils. Oh, Tum Tum, what a wonderful idea, Nutmeg said happily. I'll go up to the attic tonight and write the children a letter, telling them that all the escaped pets are moving into a new home just down the lane. Once this problem was solved, the nut mouses sat silently for a while, watching the fire flicker. They both felt very relieved that all the dramas had come to an end. We're such humdrum mice, Tum Tum, Nutmeg said eventually. It does, does seem unfair that we should have been dragged into another adventure quite so soon. I hope we don't have any more. Of course we won't, dear, Tum Tum replied confidently. Life will be a lot quieter once the general's safely back in his gun cupboard. And Nutmeg hoped very much that Tum Tum was right. The end.